most distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the 2014 Anthony N. Sapka Caribbean Awards for Excellence Awards Presentation Ceremony. I am Maria Superville Nielsen, Program Director, and it is my pleasure to again fulfill the role of Master of Ceremonies. And so we begin. Mr. Michael Mansu. As we have done in prior years, our nominating committees considered candidates from Jamaica, the OECS, Barbados, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, and submitted 15 nominees in three categories of awards. From this group of 15, our three laureates were selected. Let it be said unequivocally that the quality and number of eligible nominees continue to amaze. As in all islands, we do not lack for heroes, we do not lack for substantial achievement and accomplishment, and we do not lack for blessed individuals who dedicate their lives to excellence and perfection. So we congratulate all our nominees and thank them for letting their names be considered. We are confident that our three winners here this evening will continue to be productive and shine their light as the leaders in the pursuit of regional progress, prosperity, and purpose. Our geographical footprint is the Caribbean. Let us say the English-speaking Caribbean, with a population of five or six million people and a cultural heritage that is at once similar and at once unique, uniquely diversified. Our accomplishments in the independence and post-independence era are substantial. Over the last five or six decades, we have produced scholars, we have produced internationally renowned jurists, scientists, poets, novelists, and musical genius, pure musical genius. And we've also produced Olympic finalists, including, in today's term, term, terms, the fastest man in the world. On countless occasions with international dominance at the wicket, we, with David Rudder, joyfully rallied around the West Indies and could con confidently assert that we must never say never even in the wider kaleidoscope of our lives. Most critically, with the exception of one or two skirmishes with anarchy, we have maintained our democracies, and personal liberty and freedom have been our common inheritance. But of course, there's a less precious aspect of our experiences. Several of our fledgling island economies are depressed and stagnant, Trinidad and Tobago, and to some extent Guyana, are for the time being outliers in the economic sphere. But it is arguable that the intractable problems of deteriorating family life, lapses in governance, uncontrollable levels of serious crime, and significant service deficits in the important areas of security, health, and education affect all of our territories to varying degrees. In a real way, these deficiencies trump economics in relevance and impact. Of greatest concern, however, it seems that our leaders, having abandoned the possibilities of substantive regional integration and confronted with the uncertainties of the future, the uncertainties of globalization and a lingering world recession, are yet to articulate and introduce appropriate responses to bend the adverse currents that affect and assail us. As we look back on our successes, however, and our failures, it becomes clear that excellence is the common denominator of our destiny. An abundance of excellence that made us accomplish so much, and arguably the absence of excellence that has, that has caused us to underachieve in the critical areas that determine life quality. Personal excellence is the precursor of all success, the basic elements of excellence being genius, perseverance, hard work, a sense of communal justice, and in almost all instances, the ability to get others to share one's vision and to dream one's dreams. In the final analysis, it seems that it is excellence, and excellence multiplied by the level 
and miracle of leadership that will keep us in play, that will keep us great, and will keep us viable. And that is why the work of the Anthony N. Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence is so important and so crucial as we contemplate our opportunities and ability to manage and reconcile the difficult circumstances and contradictions that endanger our future. And if you look among the laureates of previous years, you will see that several of them, indeed most of them, have dedicated their work to improving Caribbean life in the areas where so much work needs to be done. Let us, for example, reflect on the work of Monsignor Gregory Ramkisun with the Mustard Seed Community and Mrs. Richardson Pius with her signature organization, Children First and the Bashi Bus. Both in Jamaica, their work dedicated to the improvement of family life and the integration into the mainstream of the disadvantaged and the afflicted in Jamaica. We can reflect with satisfaction on the work of laureates Rhonda Mengo and Paula Lucy Smith in Trinidad and Tobago. We have recognized and honored those who work for the environment and the native peoples, such as Annette Arjun Martins with her Guyana Marine Turtle Conservation Society, and Sydney Alicock, who has given a voice and hopeful vision to the Amerindian peoples of Guyana. And in the all-important area of environmental control and clean energy, we have recognized the early pioneering work of James Husbands of Barbados. Education and Caribbean-focused research are critical to our development. And we have among our laureates, Professor Foster of Jamaica, Professor Cord of Grenada, Professor Tiluxing and Chady of Trinidad and Tobago, Professor Hennis of Barbados, Professor Ogar of St. Vincent, all of whom continue to work on the cutting edge of medical science and the agricultural sciences, whether it be in research on diabetes or the control of parasites. We have always believed that our writers, our poets, our musical icons help us define and know ourselves and provide us with the inspiration and hunger to pursue education, cultural authenticity, dignity, and freedom. They help us confront the ambiguities of our history and transcend the troubles and tragedies of today. And they help us most importantly as we establish the bedrock values for the challenges of tomorrow. Let me remind you of Professor Ramasa, who has led the way as filmmaker and teacher of cinema. The names of Adrian Ogier, Professor Dabi Dean, and Professor Carol Phillips of St. Kitts, Dr. Kim Johnson, Dr. Lennox Honeychurch, all laureates who are in our company. The Anson McCall Foundation and the Anson McCall Group and their chairman emeritus, the towering personality of Anthony, Anthony N. Sabka, have elected to use their resources to recognize, reward, and encourage excellence. Let me ask you, in his absence, to recognize in a very special way the huge contribution and foresight of Anthony N. Sabga in creating and sustaining this important Caribbean Awards for Excellence program. You, by your presence here this evening, have also elected to support our laureates, and we thank you for this important gesture. I also wish to thank our five nominating committees, all of which worked under the chairmanship of distinguished Caribbean women for their important contribution. And of course, my colleagues, and in all cases, my seniors in the qualities that make them eminent on the final selection panel, I thank you also. I also wish to thank the Anson McCall Group and its chairman, Norman Sapka, who is here with us this evening, for the unstinting support provided in making the work of the awards program possible. At the end of this evening's function, we would have in our company 23 laureates. Their work is crucially important to the creation of a Caribbean space where every Caribbean child can expect to be nurtured in the cradle of a loving, hopeful, and faith-based faith -based family, where every Caribbean man and woman can expect the opportunity for education, economic and cultural advancement, and everyone can expect to thrive and prosper 
in a just and predictable society. Let me also confidently assert that when the history of this era is written and judgments are made on the major contributors of our time, you will find among this number several of our laureates because they gave so much to eliminate poverty. They gave so much to eliminate disease and crime. They did so much to promote family life, social and economic justice. And they did so much to end the long dark nights of struggle to hasten the arrival of a peaceful and prosperous dawn. Join me this evening in congratulating Karen D'Souza, Professor Liam Teague, and Dr. Richard Robinson. Their mighty works will bring them the joy of achievement and the thrill of satisfaction and accomplishment. And I can assure them, the Caribbean will not forget. I thank you. We now present our laureates to you. We will look at a short vignette. They will receive their prizes and they will address us for a brief moment. We start off with the 2014 Laureate in Arts and Letters, Professor Liam Teague of Trinidad and Tobago. Compared to other musical instruments, the national instrument of Trinidad and Tobago, the steel drum, is in its youth. It is less than a century old, but it has made its presence felt in world music. One of the chief navigators of the instrument's journey to its full potential is Trinidadian steel pan player, composer and teacher, Liam Teague. Liam is that new kind of panist who has studied music formally and has studied, you know, all aspects of instrumental Western music, classical music, jazz. In many ways, Liam is, he has opened a new door for steel band virtuosos and steel band arrangers. And of course, as he has always been known, even before he went abroad as a virtuoso player. The journey to those heights began with an innate talent, but it required help. Teague was introduced to the instrument as a child in his father's Cub Scout troop. As he grew older, his exceptional talent became evident, but opportunities were slim until he saw a chance and went after it. In the 1990s, uh, Professor Al O'Connor and Clifford Alexis <clears throat> from NIU, they came to Trinidad to observe some of the steel band festivals that were going on. And while they were there, they spoke about the NIU program, which at the time um, offered bachelor's and master's degrees in music with specific emphasis on the steel pan. And this was really the only tertiary edu uh, institution in the world that one could do that. So it really piqued my interest and I wrote to Al O'Connor um, literally begging him to get me to, to NIU and um, he had heard me perform and he, he was impressed and within a, I would say about a year he made it possible for me to attend NIU. Once there, Teague did not have an easy route since money was always scarce. It was through the generosity of an American businessman, Les Triller, that Teague was able to complete his studies. Having completed his studies, Teague's career exploded. He became an international performer and a professor at the very Northern Illinois University. Liam is incredibly nurturing as a teacher and as an artist, and he certainly is regarded as uh, one of the finest, if not the finest, uh, artists on steel pan in the world. He plays with symphonies all over the world, from Taiwan to Panama. His performances are innovative in their blending of styles and instruments, making him a truly unique talent. When I came to NIU as a student, I was very blessed to um, study with Professor Robert Chappell, who at the time was the head of percussion studies. And this gentleman is one of the most versatile musicians that I've had the pleasure to work with. 
So he and I started working together and we've created a lot of original music for the steel pan and we combined the instrument with various uh, instruments such as the, the piano, the Indian tabla, marimba, vibraphone, you name it, we tried to do it. Liam Teague has not forgotten his beginnings. He returns to arrange for Panorama and has also forged links with the University of the West Indies and its students. He has partnered with um, a number of our students, um, some of our, our best and brightest, when they have graduated um, at the top of their, of, the, of their subsequent classes, successive classes, he has managed to arrange scholarships for them at Northern Illinois University, um, where he teaches. So we've had a number of students who have gone there for their masters, and not only has he taught them, but he has mentored them and some, some of them have, have then gone on and are pursuing their doctoral work. Some of them have come back here with that knowledge and have rejoined um, UWE as adjunct staff. What makes him protect, uh, perhaps, uh, makes him perhaps uh, most endearing is he's incredibly humble. He meets the students where they are and uh, he uh, works very hard to take the students forward uh, in a very positive fashion. Liam Teague is a virtuoso performer educator and I think he has exceptional skill to impart to the younger generation and share his musical knowledge. Though he is encouraged by these successes, Liam Teague's ambition has only just begun to be realized. It's always been very important to me to highlight the profundity of the steel pan um, by playing in a variety of styles, musical styles. So I've been blessed to uh, commission composers like Michael Krollgrass, who is a Pulitzer Prize winner, Libby Larson, a Grammy Award winner, um, Dr. Jan Bach, who wrote one, to my knowledge, the first steel pan concerto in the world. If Liam is able to cut through the, what I have to call the natural reluctance of some people to adopt steel pan as something um, in addition to Calypso, to investigate all of the other types of possibilities, if people will follow um, his own particular vision with that, then I think there is a bright future. One of the things that does concern me is going beyond, beyond Panorama. And so I really try my best to meet with as many up-and-coming players as possible and help them to work on their musical development. For these reasons, Professor Liam T, Steel Pan Virtuoso, is the Anthony N. Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence Laureate in Arts and Letters for 2014. It's been my life's work to consistently highlight the steel pan's profundity, versatility, and beauty. And I'm sincerely grateful to the Ansa McCall Foundation for recognizing my humble effort, efforts. This evening, I'd like to pay homage to a number of people who have played integral roles in my life. My mother, Pearl Teague, and my late father, Russell Teague. I've often wondered why my parents never tried to dissuade me from following a life in music, which, truth be told, does not always offer the type of security that other disciplines may. I read recently that John Lennon of the Beatles, when asked by his high school teacher what he wanted to be when he grew up, simply responded, happy. To my mother and to my late father, I'm so appreciative of all the sacrifices that you have made, and I thank you for allowing me to follow my passion and be happy. I love you. Mahatma Gandhi once said that the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. The people that I'm about to recognize have inspired, supported, and helped shape my early life as a musician. Mrs. Shirley James. Mrs. James made it possible for me to have violin lessons from an early age and also invited me to be a part of the then National Youth Orchestra of Trinidad and Tobago. The experience playing in that ensemble proved to be an invaluable asset in my musical development. Mrs. James has been instrumental in assisting so many young people, and because of her caring and generous nature, 
The importance of serving others was embedded into my consciousness from a very early age. Thank you very much, Mrs. James. Miss Joy Caesar. When I was accepted to read for a bachelor's degree in music with specific emphasis on the steel pan at Northern Illinois University in the USA, the university offered me a partial scholarship. Not having the means to personally fund the rest of my education, I contacted several individuals and businesses for assistance, but to no avail. Luckily, God sent an angel in the form of Miss Joy Caesar, who was the then vice president of Citibank and also the director of the Southern Air Squire. Miss Caesar made it possible for me to complete my freshman year at NIU. She also took a genuine interest in the well-being of my family. Miss Caesar, were it not for your intervention, I probably would not have been able to realize many of my dreams, and I remain eternally grateful to you. Mr. Robert Foster, before leaving these shores to further my education, I was approached by Robert Foster about a recording project. Though I felt undeserving of this opportunity, I eventually agreed, and the work that resulted was the CD, Hands Like Lightning. Mr. Foster eventually assumed the role of my manager, and our collaborative efforts resulted in several other recordings. While I have always been thankful for Mr. Foster's support and guidance career-wise, it is the life lessons that he taught me, particularly the importance of respecting and honoring one's parents and preparing for the future that I cherish even more. Mr. Foster, you have been a father figure, and I will never forget what you have done for me. To Al O'Connor, Cliff Alexis, Lester Triller, and Cynthia Steele, your love, support, and encouragement is deeply, deeply appreciated. To my wife, Lorena Nunez, and children, Jaden and Jada Teague Nunez, thank you for everything. Lorena, we could write volumes about the trials and tribulations that we have had to encounter and the sacrifices that, that we have had to make to actually be together. Thank you for being such an amazing wife and mother and for putting up with the not so conventional life that is part of being married to a musician. To my children, Jaden and Jada, you are my everything. Last and definitely not least, to the pioneers of the steel pan. During the embryonic stages of the steel pan, its practitioners were often treated with utter disrespect and indifference and were ostracized by Trinidadian society. To amplify this point, allow me to read you a commentary that was sent to the editor of the Trinidad Guardian on June 6, 1946. Quote, Can beating is pan beating in any language and in any form. It does nobody any good, and when it is indulged in all day, all night, day in and day out, it is abominable. Why is there no legislation to control it? If it must continue, and if by virtue of its alleged inherent beauty and charm, it will someday bring popularity and fame to the island and fortune to the beaters, then by all means, let it go on, but in the forest and other desolate places. Close quote. Having to face such attitudes on a daily basis, it is nothing short of miraculous that Pan's pioneers could maintain the vision, belief, and fortitude which would prove influential in the realization of the steel pan as a legitimate musical instrument. In addition, whether directly or indirectly, their audacity and bold-facedness, as Dr. Kim Johnson so accurately puts it, has allowed people like myself, through the medium of the pan, to captivate the hearts, souls, and imaginations of people across the globe. While there is no doubt that the steel pan has made astronomical strides, I remain convinced that we have just begun to scratch the surface of the instrument's potential. Whether as a performer, educator, composer, and or arranger, I am committed to taking the steel, pipes, steel pan to heights unknown and will remain a humble servant of Trinidad and Tobago and the rest of the Caribbean region. Once again, thank you to the Ansa Macal Foundation for this tremendous honor. Blessings to you, ladies and gentlemen. I happily present to you now our 2014 Laureate in Public and Civic Contributions.
Violence is regrettably a large part of everyday Caribbean reality. But within the larger theater of violence are even darker places, like the violence towards women and children. It is in these dark places that Guyanese activist Karen D'Souza has ventured to bring light. Karen has been working with children, underprivileged children and women victims of abuse for a number of years. She's a strong woman and she's fearless, she's very brave. D'Souza began this journey in 1986 when she co-founded the organization Red Thread with six other women. All the women were politically active, but the great innovation of Red Thread was that it eschewed party affiliation, which in Guyana was unprecedented given its divisive racial politics. Red Thread was founded in October 1986 uh, by seven of us. All of us were at the time either members or supporters of the Working People's Alliance, which was popularly led by Walter Rodney. And women that we were trying to organize to protest against food shortages and so on, basically told us that they didn't want anything to do with what they considered party politics. What they needed was money. We began Red Thread um, as something to generate income for grassroots women in two African and two Indian communities first, and then immediately after in Amerindian communities as well. D'Souza was an unwilling convert to action outside of politics. So I was dragged kicking and screaming into Red Thread because I, I, I felt that the work I was doing in the WPA was important and necessary. Um, eventually changed that view. And from its beginnings, the vision and mission of Red Thread grew. Working with women, um, we recognized that many of them were survivors of domestic violence. Um, and they also have high levels of um, child abuse also. In addressing the violence against women, the police intimidation, legal harassment, and harassment of their political lives had taught the founders lessons they could use to help the poor. I have had, you know, many extraordinary encounters with Karen. One I remember particularly is when we were both arrested um, in New Amsterdam. In the end, they said, well, you're free to go, but you'll have to sign this statement saying that you didn't suffer any brutality or anything like that while you were in police custody. We all signed it because we were anxious to get going. Karen absolutely refused to sign any such statement. Well, there was, there was a period of my life, the, the, the party period of my life, where I could, I could almost guarantee being arrested once I stepped out onto the street. Karen D'Souza herself was probably the most arrested person in Guyana because of her involvement with the WPA. So, for many of us, we spent a lot of time in court either addressing charges against us or supporting members who had been charged. So we got to know the court system very well. From these beginnings, D'Souza and Red Thread are today working with the establishment for the common cause of empowering and protecting women and children. Karen has been doing a lot of work in the areas of violence. Um, she's been an advocate on women's rights, women's human rights, and especially on issues such as rape and, and violence, interpersonal violence, domestic violence. And she has worked throughout Guyana in many hinterland communities with grassroots women. More than that, Red Thread has also been able to affect the legal framework to address these issues. Several of the major achievements have been the uh, passing of medical termination pregnancy legislation in the early 90s, uh, passing of the Domestic Violence Act in mid-90s, and the um, reform of sexual offences legislation four or, five, four or five years ago. Red Thread and D'Souza have also contributed to academic research and the provision of data on the issues of abuse and women's rights in Guyana. For all her work, 
D'Souza is extremely diffident and downplays her own individual effort. The, the, the culture, our culture, looks for leaders in a certain way, looks for individuals and selects individuals. But we don't spend a lot of time recognizing the enormous heroism that goes into bringing up children, raising children, among the poor I'm talking about. Nonetheless, the Sousa's and Red Thread's efforts have had the effects in the places they matter the most. Red Thread don't really like give you finance, finance support, but mostly they give you tools so that you could help yourself. Basically, that's what worked for me. The independence that they give you and the self-confidence that you take away. So that's what I would try to help other women or girls that would come to Red Thread. I was uh, privileged to be able to, to give her uh, an award, the Woman of Courage Award, which the U.S. government offers to uh, women throughout the world who are doing great things on behalf of women. To her, getting an award, while uh, wonderful and, and, and great for the organization she represents, uh, it, it wasn't as important as getting out there and doing everything she could to, to help people. For these reasons, Karen D'Souza is the Anthony N. Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence Laureate in Public and Civic Contributions for 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Red Thread was born 28 years ago, in 1986, in the aftermath of the crisis of the left in the Caribbean and the onset of neoliberal development in our region. Our political purpose, mission, and vision have been shaped through our engagement with the marginalized women and the communities in which they live in the coastal and interior regions of Guyana. So, since the crises we currently face do not only affect women, you may ask, why a women's organization? The explanation lies in our understanding of the role of women as producers and reproducers of labor. It is women who keep our families and communities intact and functioning. This means that the better informed, organized, and supported women are, the healthier our children, youth, men, and communities will be. Our work has made it clear, if you address the needs of women, you address the needs of communities. Red Thread has survived the disdain, skepticism, and hostility of successive governments in Guyana largely because of our commitment to our vision as opposed to funding, and because of the ever-present need to work with those without a voice, the working poor, the victimized and marginalized, to challenge the structural inequalities in our society, which have given rise to an epidemic of economic, social, and physical violence, not only in Guyana and the Caribbean, but throughout the Global South. In Guyana, despite the so-called recent success story of economic development and the celebration of macroeconomic growth, we live with an ever-widening gap between the wealthy and the poor. The presence of mansions in gated communities in which a number of our politicians live, lying cheek by jowl with the shacks in squatter communities, give voice to the artificiality of the current MDG indicators of development. One of the women in Red Thread recently called on the government to include her household economy in their calculations since her macroeconomic fundamentals were lagging far behind those the government boasts about. Indeed, in all our territories, 
we can see evidence of tremendous wealth and also the most abject poverty. We can talk about those who routinely fly to Miami for their weekend shopping and those who are challenged to find the next meal for their children. It is in placing the latter at the heart of our concerns that Red Thread stands apart from all the civil society organizations that have arisen from the neoliberal agenda. The so-called NGOization of development has allowed NGOs to mushroom up, but also to all too quickly disappear when the funding dries up. Red Thread's vision of social justice and transformed relations between our peoples is a denial of the view that development can come from such NGOs engaging in paid project after paid project. As a region, I would suggest we must examine critically the economic and political policies and programs that are contributing to the growing numbers of the voiceless and marginalized. It is madness to continue to implement programs whose design is to further impoverish the poor and expect that the occasional alleviation measure will correct the imbalance. The trickle-down theories do not work. We've seen this since the first structural adjustment programs in this region back in the 80s. But with all my concerns and criticisms, we can still celebrate the determination and commitment of many, many unnamed groups and individuals in our region. I must name two of my unsung heroes, Cora Bell of Red Thread and Clotel Walcott, the founder of the National Union of Domestic Workers of Trinidad and Tobago, after whom we named the Labor Rights Drop-In Service at our Women's Center. We can also celebrate the vision of the founder of the Anthony N. Sabgo Award, an award which I believe exemplifies a view of forward-thinking corporate responsibility, which in the midst of despair and cynicism celebrates a belief in the human potential of this region. I would like to thank the Guyana Committee for their support for my nomination I must also especially thank the Guyana researcher, Roxana, for her dogged determination to complete her assignment. Thank you, Linda, for your unwavering support of my work. I am particularly appreciative of this award because the foundation, in recognizing my work, is validating the mission of the committed women of Red Thread and signaling to the region that one does not have to accept the status quo, that having a vision of a truly democratic future is vital, that the work of organizing and advocacy are critical to that vision, and that the increasing violence against women and children is not to be tolerated. There is much truth in the words of the song, until the philosophy that holds one man superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned, everywhere is war. We can end the wars, all of them. Thank you very much. I'm equally pleased to present to you our 2014 laureate in science and technology Dr. Richard Robertson of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Adversity is the building block of courage. We hear it often in the experience of remarkable individuals who transform their catastrophes into learning experiences to benefit others. This is exactly what happened to Dr. Richard Robertson, volcanologist and geologist. In 1979, he was caught with his family in St. Vincent when Soufre erupted. I first got to know 
Richie when he came to the UWI Mona campus to pursue a degree in geology. Uh, Richie came to us as a result of the eruption of the Soufre volcano in St. Vincent. Being a Vincentian, um, it was felt that they should train a Vincentian person to monitor um, the volcano after its activity in 1979. Dr. Robertson surpassed expectations, making original contributions to the science of volcanology as a graduate and postgraduate student in the UK and the Caribbean. The insights in some of the papers that Dr. Robertson has published 10 years ago now are incredible. They, are, they have ideas in them that many members of the volcanology community are just coming around to now. So he's a remarkable scientist for how he brings together all sorts of different strands of knowledge. Uh, Dr. Robertson is really an outstanding scientist, but um, when he was uh, uh, working at the Montserrat Volcano Observatory, he did some very uh, important uh, research on some of the explosions and some of the pyroclastic flows, and he made some uh, important discoveries uh, about the, um, uh, these rather rare um, deep melt magmas. When his education was complete, the natural place for him was UWI's Seismic Research Center, which he joined in 1993. As its director, Dr. Robertson transformed the center. Dr. Robertson, in his capacity as director, I think is one of those who has really clearly charted a way forward for the center in a very structured way. Uh, in terms of moving the center forward on, the, on a, not only a regional stage, but certainly on a global stage. That, I think, has been his legacy here at the Seismic Research Center. He's now looking at ways in which we can continue research and education and outreach, which is novel for a scientific center such as ours. One of the failures, I think, um, prior to Richie being director was at Seismic Research Center. There was not enough coverage was given of the work that was being done by the center um, to the public in the Caribbean and um, that public education side was one area where he identified that we needed to have some more thrust in and I think now people are feel far more conscious of the work and aware of the work that is being done by the Seismic Research Center. It might seem counterintuitive that the public should need education on geologic events since their effects are so rare. You tend to think that it happen, hasn't happened in your lifetime, is unlikely to happen. And if we're only thinking in terms of short time periods, you know, five years, you know, we're in, a, in the region we're on this five year cycle because of political reasons, we'd, we would never factor in these kinds of hazards that happen over 10, 20, 100 years of years, but which when they happen, they're going to set you back in a significant way. In, in 1995 eruption in Montserrat, we went into Montserrat after the eruption had started and people were saying that they didn't know, first of all, they, they, they had a volcano. They didn't know that the volcano could erupt. So we were, uh, we were totally amazed because we thought we were saying that all the time. But the consequences of unwillingness to plan for these eventualities were demonstrated by the devastating eruptions in Soufre, Montserrat, and most recently in the Haitian earthquake of 2010. There are a number of places in the region, right here in Trinidad, that is exactly like that in terms of having a dense population, a concentration of people, poorly built structures, and close to an area where you could have a large mountain earthquake. That's why we have, to have, we have to take these things seriously. Unfortunately, these relatively frequent events do not mean we can take comfort for the future. It's difficult to put a, a probability in it. I think what we tend to look at is how long ago one of these events happened and what is the kind of general return period of these events. And, and the kind of magnitude I'm talking about is a magnitude um, 7.58 earthquake. Various of my colleagues and, and I have been saying that we are overdue or we are due for a large event that could have devastating impact. Dr. Robertson's tireless work in this field has increased education and regional preparedness. But it has also helped the perception and efficiency of the region and its institutions. He's also led the Seismic Research Centre at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad um, to be really one of the top, uh, most uh, highly regarded uh, in institutions in volcanology in the world. For his devotion to science, public education and building an institution crucial to the region's survival, Dr. Richard Robertson is the Anthony N. Sabga Caribbean Awards for Excellence Laureate in Science and Technology for 2014.
distinguished colleagues, friends, family, ladies and gentlemen, good night. I would like to start this evening by expressing my sincere thanks to the Ansa Makal Foundation and Dr. Anthony Sarpka for their vision in conceiving of and continuing to promote this award program. Despite the challenges we face in this region, I have a strong belief in the Caribbean. And I consider that recognition of our own exemplars is extremely important if we are to build a Caribbean civilization. Although my path to this podium tonight was ignited by the impact of an erupting volcano on a young teenage mind who still then had not decided what he wanted to do, it was helped in no small measure by some fantastic people along the way. In accepting this award tonight, therefore, I pay tribute to my family, to my friends, and to my colleagues, especially those at that place where I've spent the last or most of my professional life, the Seismic Research Center of the University of the West Indies. I'm indeed deeply indebted to all of you. I consider myself particularly fortunate to have been guided, supported, and influenced in my development by three strong women. My mother, whose unwavering belief in and support of her children provided a firm bedrock upon which to build our lives. My sister, whose own accomplishments and determination to find her own chosen path was both an inspiration and a driving force for me to find my own. And my wife, my partner in life, whose friendship, love and support has enabled me to stay rooted, confident and resolute in my endeavors. I'm also thankful for the sterling examples of scientific prowess provided by such Vincentians as Dr. I. Earl Kirby, Professor Julian Duncan, and Professor Leonardo Garo. I'm glad for the guidance provided by such persons as Dr. and Mrs. Dr. Dexter and Mrs. Frieda Shim, Professor Steve and Ann Sparks, and Professor Trevor Jackson. To my friends and colleagues, I am especially grateful. I stand before you tonight as a geologist by training and a volcanologist by experience. In sum, I am an earth scientist who has had the good fortune of working with a great team of people. In a region where natural processes that have engaged our scientific interests happen often enough to provide sufficient data to keep us all fully engaged in solving scientific problems. I've always been driven by challenges and by a desire to find solutions to mitigating natural hazards. In this regard, there was no better place for me to find a place than the University of the West Indies Seismic Research Center, the regional agency with the mandate to monitor geological hazards and to provide professional advice on these to the Eastern Caribbean region. This is an agency that has managed to survive for over 60 years in a region with limited resources and despite having responsibility for hazardous events that often occur in time scales that pose serious challenges to maintaining society's interests. It is indeed wonderful to receive this award in the 61st year of existence of this institution. No organization survives for 60 years simply on the strength of one individual. And I consider that this award tonight is as much a recognition of my own efforts as it is of the entire team at the SRC. This center has an excellent record of providing guidance to disaster management officials, governments, businesses, civil society, and the public on all aspects of geologic hazards. It is engaged in a multifaceted education and outreach program that focuses on young people and on the preparation of specialized outreach products for various types of audiences. Distinguished guests, the Caribbean is a multi-hazard landscape in which human settlement has placed increasing pressures on the environment, resulting in increased vulnerability to natural hazards. One would be hard pressed to live anywhere in these islands that is not susceptible to the impact of at least one type of hazard, whether natural or man-made. We live in a region where efforts at sustainable development can be set back severely by an earthquake, by an erupting volcano, or by a tsunami. 
the work of the SRC in disaster risk reduction in the Caribbean is therefore critical and needs to be provided with greater support. So while I'm honored and humbled to be recognized for my work, I believe that this, op this award provides an opportunity. An opportunity to focus attention on the work of the center and on the need for greater efforts to be made towards building resilience to natural hazards in the region. We need help to support applied research that is relevant and that can provide significant impact on our national and regional development agenda, and ultimately on the lives of people in communities in the region. We would like to move away from simply monitoring data collection and, and, and research to the creation of useful tools that policymakers and planners can apply to guarantee that development is sustained in these islands. With these products, we would be ensuring that knowledge of hazards is not only kept amongst the scientific community, but have been packaged in a manner that is applicable and useful to a wide range of stakeholders. In closing, I wish once again to commend the Foundation for its foresight in promoting these awards and to congratulate my fellow laureates. Like the others who have gone before me, it is my intention to use the opportunities provided through this award to further my work in the region. Many gaps exist in our knowledge of natural hazards, and there is still much to be done. I therefore leave you with the words of borrowed from one of our first laureates, Professor Terence Forrester, who in accepting his award noted that scientific research now and in the proximate future is of vital importance to the development of our Caribbean people. This is a statement with which I am in complete agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, family, friends and colleagues, I thank you. You have heard our laureates. You have heard the passion with which they speak of their work. It is this passion that sets them apart. We applaud, as we have done many times this evening, excellence in action and have briefly glimpsed the potential our laureates have to change our future, the future of our Caribbean people. Thank you all for joining us this evening to celebrate the achievements of laureates Liam Teague, Karen D'Souza, and Richard Robinson. We at the Anthony N. Sabka Caribbean Awards for Excellence are honored by your presence. In closing, allow me to echo the words of His Excellency, Sir Frederick Ballantyne, Governor General of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who so graciously provided the foreword to our event program. And he says, it is important to recognize that those whom we honor are a subset of a larger cadre of persons whose leadership in their respective fields will make us all stronger. Among us are legions of individuals whose levels of excellence may never be publicly recognized or formally rewarded. It is up to each of us every day to find appropriate ways to recognize all their valuable contributions to our Caribbean community and to humanity. They work to improve our world. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good night, and may God bless us all.